My name is Dave Deptula, former Air Force Lieutenant General. I uh, served in the Air Force for almost 35 years, was one of the first lieutenants ever selected to fly the F-15, which at the time was a most modern fighter of its type. And then went on to a mid-level career, Armed Forces Staff College, and then up to the Pentagon. In late July of 1990, Saddam invaded Kuwait while I was on vacation. I came back and then immediately got involved in some of the preliminary anticipatory planning and how air power could be applied to take care of the problem in uh, Kuwait. And lo and behold, two weeks later, I found myself in uh, Riyadh, Saudi Arabia, working for uh, General Chuck Horner as a key air campaign planner. I planned the offensive air campaign for Operation Desert Storm. Came back from Desert Storm back into the Pentagon for a little while and helped translate some of the lessons that we had learned into uh, air power doctrine. Went back to flying assignment in F-15s, then came back to National War College, 93, 94, and got selected to be the Air Force representative on the Commission on Roles and Missions, which is a congressional commission looking at the future of our military forces. Then went back to flying, this time as an operations group commander in the F-15, then came back to Washington, this time as an Air Force representative on the National Defense Panel. This is the beginning of the first quadrennial defense review in the United States military. After that, I had the privilege to come out to a Turkey as a combined joint task force commander for Operation Northern Watch no-fly zone operations over Iraq. After Operation Northern Watch came back to Washington to run the second quadrennial defense review, I was in the Pentagon when it was hit by the uh, third aircraft in the 9-11 attacks. And five days later, the chief of staff of the Air Force asked me if I'd go over to Saudi Arabia and direct the uh, Combined Air Operations Center for Operation Enduring Freedom. I did the planning for the opening stages of Operation Enduring Freedom and also oversaw the first armed use of a remotely piloted aircraft UAV, unmanned aerial vehicle, drone, whatever term you'd like to use. Came back from there and was the director of plans and programs for Air Combat Command, then went out to the Pacific, became the director of operations out there, then the deputy commander of Pacific Air Forces, and finally what was called the Warfighting Headquarters Commander, responsible for the commander of Pacific Command for everything outside of Korea and the Pacific area of operations. Then I got a call one day, and the chief staff of the Air Force said, hey, Dave, we'd like you to come back and be the first three-star director of intelligence for the Air Force. It made a lot of sense because I've been a consummate user of intelligence for a long time, even though my focus was on operations. I convinced the chief to not make the position just the director of intelligence, but make it the director of intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance because... My goal still to this day is to integrate intelligence and operations into a seamless whole. I also convinced him to give me the portfolio for remotely piloted aircraft, drones, because I wanted to treat that little piece of fiberglass flying around in the sky, the sensors that it hosts, as well as the analysts that take that information and translate it into knowledge as an entire enterprise. That still remains a challenge today. I transitioned from the Air Force into a, a suit and tie in 2010, and today as the dean of the Mitchell Institute for Aerospace Power Studies, I'm uh, trying to advocate and articulate the virtues and values of operating in the third dimension. In reflecting over the career that I had from 1976 to 2010 to today, I think what we've seen over those 30, almost 40 years now, is an evolution of the revolution of air power. In other words, there have been some dramatic changes along the way. So let me turn that into some specifics. The first Gulf War operation, the Desert Storm. During the first 24-hour period in Operation Desert Storm, we attacked more targets across the breadth and depth of Iraq than we did during the combined bomber offensive in the years 1942 and 1943 in World War II. So the question becomes, how did that happen? It was a combination of 
the advancement in technologies that allowed us to hit targets with extreme precision, number one, with low observability or stealth, which dramatically reduced the force protection requirements for aircraft to penetrate extremely highly defended areas before they could release their weapons. It was also an effects-based methodology to planning that moved beyond absolute destruction as a measure of merit and looked at effects in terms of what one wanted to achieve by the application of force. I'll give you a more specific example here in a comparison of the very first target hit in Operation Desert Storm using non-stealthy aircraft along with what stealthy aircraft were doing at the time. Now remember, it's not just stealth, it's stealth and precision. The first target that was attacked with conventional non-stealthy aircraft was Shaiba Airfield down in the Basra area. The targets consisted of three hangars. So there were three aim points at the airport. The force package consisted of 41 aircraft, eight of them dropping bombs. There were four Saudi tornadoes. There were four Navy A6s. Those were the bomb droppers. And then there was a combination of five Marine EA-6B jamming aircraft 17 Navy FNA 18s carrying high speed anti radiation missiles to take out one type of surface to air missile system. Then there were four or five more F 4G wild weasels from the US Air Force to take out a different kind of surface to air missile system. And then we used three drones to basically tickle the air defenses to cause the Iraqis to bring their acquisition radars online so we could use these high speed anti radiation missiles to destroy them. So I might be off by one or two numbers, but 41 aircraft, eight of them, to drop bombs on one target with three aim points. Now, at the exact same time, I have 20 F-117 stealth aircraft that are targeted against 20 separate targets with 38 separate aim points. All 20 of those airplanes are dropping weapons. No force protection required. So I'm covering 38 aim points as opposed to three aim points with less than half the same number of aircraft. In other words, it took the equivalent of 19 non-stealthy aircraft to do the same work that one stealthy aircraft could. That's a hands-on example of the impact of technology. That is the combination of stealth and precision. But there's another piece to the equation. When we first did the planning, the intelligence folks told me that there were essentially two targets that were critical because they held the command and control arrangements and connectivity to maintain the air defenses in Iraq. The Sector Operations Center down at Talil Airfield in southeastern Iraq and the Air Defense Headquarters up in Baghdad itself. Now, these two facilities were built to sustain a nuclear attack because of the previous eight years of war between Iraq and Iran. So they had two command bunkers in the bottom underground, 37 feet of aggregate steel, concrete, and dirt on top of them. The initial estimate by our attack planners is that it would take a combination of four GBU-27 2,000-pound penetrating munitions plus four GBU-10s, which are 2,000-pound munitions, hitting one right after the other to dig down to get to the command bunker. So if you do the math, eight weapons per each side of these facilities, 16 weapons per facility, 32 total weapons. Well, we only had 16 F-117s available at that time. This is in August of 1990, early August. You use up all your F-117s to take out these two targets. Well, it's worth it if, in fact, you can poke the eyes out of the adversary to allow the rest of the non-stealthy aircraft to come in and attack all the targets. 30 days later, we're now on an airplane going down to take the attack plans to brief the Navy component commander, Admiral Maws, and the Marine component commander, Major General Royal T. Moore, on board the USS LaSalle in Manama, Bahrain. At that time, it's hard for people today to imagine this, but there was no internet. You didn't pass emails. Plus, the planning at that stage was extraordinarily classified, secret. And so we took an airplane to brief face-to-face. 
I was given a analysis of the Iraqi air defense system, and I thought I'd have some time to read it on the airplane going down. It's very difficult to describe how intense the planning was. We were awake 20 hours a day because General Horner, who was the air component commander, led us to believe that we were going to execute in five days. So we were on a rolling five-day execution. (laughs) After about 30 days, we figured out we weren't going to do it in five days. But still, there was this intensity because new assets, new aircraft were flying into theater, new targets, intel would come up, new munitions were coming up, and you're having to replan on an hourly basis. Well, General Glosson was a guy who went on the trip. And if you sit next to him, you're not going to be reading a book. You're going to be engaged in discussion. So I didn't have a chance to read this thing. But after we brief Admiral Maws, we take off in our C-21 from Manama to go back to Riyadh. Right after takeoff, the airplane fills up with smoke. There was a fire behind the instrument panel in the cockpit. We immediately landed. Now we're waiting for another airplane to come get us from Riyadh. And now I did have time to read this manual. When I read the analysis, it turns out there aren't just two air defense operations centers in Iraq. There are five sector operation centers, and associated with every five of these sector operation centers were five to seven interceptor operation centers, any one of which could pick up the load. This was a networked air defense system. Now what are we going to do? We got over 40 separate targets, any one of which can pick up the load. So the next day, I'm in a discussion with the Intel folks because I want to shut this whole system down. But the only way to do that is to put a weapon on every one of these targets. We were in the Royal Saudi Air Force headquarters building, which is a long, great big building. I said, you know, a 2,000 pound bomb could go off on the other side of this building. And we wouldn't be dead, but we sure as heck wouldn't be continuing this conversation with a cup of coffee. I don't need to put 16 weapons on that facility. I only need to put one. Because if I put one in there, do you think the people that work there are going to come back the next day? It's not about destruction. It's about terminating the function. I went back, and instead of putting 16 weapons on those facilities, I only put one, or planned one. Actually, the critical ones, I did two, because you never rely on one for anything except if it's lower probability and you have to. That was taking an effects-based approach to targeting. I don't need to destroy those bunkers. All I need to do is keep people from operating them. I had a gentleman who was from Electronic Security Command. I said, I want you to come in here every day and you tell me if there are any emissions coming out of those facilities. If they are, then they're going to get a visit from an F-117 and a GBU-27 that night. I'll give you one more example. On the 15th of February, 1991, we got a report from Central Command J-2, the Intel folks. They're assessing how we're doing against the electric target set. In the electric target set category, there were 26 targets. They claimed on the 15th of February that we hadn't accomplished our objectives because we hadn't achieved 85% level of destruction against the 26 electric power plants. Our plan was never to destroy the electric power plants. We wanted to be able to rapidly reconstitute those facilities as an incentive to the people to help overthrow Saddam. We didn't target the generator halls or any of the things that caused destruction. We targeted the transformer facilities to minimize destruction. A question that's been asked me over the years is, what was the basis for how you planned the air campaign in Operation Desert Storm? Well, the origins of the strategy evolved from my participation in working for John Warden in the late 80s and talking about strategic applications of air power and also operational level applications. John had come up with his five rings theory, strategic centers of gravity. It's an excellent model that can be applied to any nation state or any kind of organization. If you have leadership, one critical center of gravity, you have key essential systems that support an organization or a nation state. You have infrastructure, for example, you know, electricity, oil production, distribution, roads, bridges. You have the population. And then you have fielded military forces or protection or security. Tell me an organization or a nation state that doesn't consist of those five basic elements. 
The question now becomes, all right, what do you want to accomplish in each of those cases? And what are the operational centers of gravity that support those? Those essentially became the target sets, and we had 12 of them. There was leadership, command control, communications, electricity, oil production and storage, naval forces, strategic air defense, airfields. Then flowing from them, you have tactical level centers of gravity. Those were the individual targets themselves. Electricity, 26 electric target sites. Now, during the war, everyone wanted their own target hit, and these new target nominations would flow in. Well, I had a desired effect for each one of those 12 operational centers of gravity that, if accomplished, would meet the objective at the strategic level. So I'd make a decision as to whether that new target set contributed more or less to what we already had planned. That's how I'd make the decision whether to put that on the master target plan for that particular day. At the beginning, we were generating a 3,000 sortie a day attack plan. What was most effective was tying every tactical level action to a strategic center of gravity. Because if you don't do that, then you're just applying weapons to random targets without any strategy. That's exactly what happened in Vietnam. We were throwing thousands and thousands of bombs at targets and nobody knew why or what for, or to what effect, or for what outcome. It was also an economy of force operation. You don't have to kill every electric target. You don't have to destroy every command bunker. All you have to do is stop their output. The philosophy of the early air power pioneers, Trenchard, Mitchell, Arnold, Hayward Hansel, their understanding was of the same level and approach that I had many decades later. What was missing in their theories was they didn't have the technologies available to turn them into reality. By the time that Desert Storm came around, technology had caught up with theory, and we were able to apply the vision of some of the early air power pioneers. This whole notion of effects-based targeting is not new, although its application was. It's basic Sun Tzu. Sun Tzu was a guy who postulated that the acme of skill is to be able to get your adversary to lay down their arms without an attack upon the city-state being conducted at all. And that's what we did. Desert Storm actually was a turning point in the conduct of modern warfare. You saw a dramatic decrease in expectations of casualties. We had some army generals go up and testify in front of the U.S. Congress prior to a Desert Storm that they would experience 10,000 casualties. We lost 146 Americans. Any loss of life is terrible. But given the numbers of personnel involved, that's fewer number of people that you normally lose in training. Now, only about 5 to 8% of the weapons in Desert Storm, tens of thousands of weapons were used, were precision. If you fast forward from 91 to 99, eight years, about 90% of the munitions employed in Allied force were precision munitions. During World War II, it took approximately 1,000 bombers, 10,000 men at the time, all right, 10 people per bomber, and about 10,000 weapons to effectively negate one target. Desert Storm, we were affecting two targets with one aircraft. By the time you get to Operation Allied Force, now you have the B-2 involved, which can drop 80 separately targetable precision munitions. You know what the most effective target was in Operation Allied Force? A cigarette factory because the majority of the population smoke. When the cigarette factory was destroyed, the populace got upset with Milosevic and said, hey, knock this crap off. We want our smokes. Now, it wasn't that simple, but the gist of it was getting to those elements that can help coerce an adversary leadership to act in accordance with your strategic interest. In other words, okay, stop. And that's what happened. It's a dramatic example of the effectiveness 
of the air power instrument when used in conjunction with an effects-based strategy. Unified protector, that was another one where there were no surface forces involved except perhaps a small number of special operations folks. Unified protector was a Libyan operation. People can talk about the wisdom in taking out Gaddafi or not in retrospect. But if you look at what air power was able to do with indigenous forces on the ground in Libya, in terms of funneling and capturing and providing the means to capture Gaddafi and do away with his dictatorship, it was extraordinarily effective. Air power was used in conjunction with indigenous forces, not unlike occurred in the first 60 days of operation Enduring Freedom. Enduring Freedom was the response to the terrorist attacks of 9-11. The Taliban operating in Afghanistan were giving cover to al-Qaeda to provide them territory from which to organize their attacks. The Taliban were giving them an ultimatum to hand over the al-Qaeda leadership and cease supporting them, or they'd come under attack. They elected to come under attack. The air operation was initiated on October 7, 2001. In less than three months, we'd met our objectives. We removed the Taliban regime from governance in Afghanistan. A government friendly to the coalition was empowered, and we had eliminated the al-Qaeda terrorist training camps. We were done. Exit. If you do it again, we'll be back. But we'd accomplished those security objectives so quick that Central Command hadn't even finished the deployment planning of the decisive force in joint doctrine, in other words, hundreds of thousands of pairs of boots on the ground, to go into theater. Air power was extraordinarily effective in operating in conjunction with the Northern Alliance or Afghanistan surface forces to empower them to the degree that they could eject the Taliban. Afghanistan ground forces had been fighting the Taliban for many, many years until 2001 on their own and they were losing. What happened in October 2001? The United States and her allies brought to bear air power and in less than 30 days, Kabul was taken over, Kandahar was taken over, and the equation had changed. All right, so let's move to where we are today. Operation Inherent Resolve, operations against the Islamic State in both Iraq and Syria. Operations commenced in August of 2014, and as of May 2018, the Islamic State has pretty much ceased to function as an operation. Air power was the key element that caused the collapse of the Islamic State. Unfortunately, it was applied as a drizzle for over three years, when it could have been applied as a thunderstorm, in three weeks to three months, and we could have been done with the Islamic State then. Now, ground soldiers were leading the operation, but you had a political dimension too. You had President Obama, who did not want to get involved in Syria in any way, shape, or form, but because of the horrendous atrocities being promulgated by the Islamic State, he had to do something. So he entered with the minimum amount of force possible, with a strategy focus on assisting the Iraqis regain their sovereignty by themselves and train them to the point where they could eject the occupying Islamic State forces first. That was backwards from the strategy that should have been imposed. What was critical to the allies in dealing with the Islamic State was not helping Iraq regain their sovereignty. While maybe desirable, it wasn't critical to the population of the United Kingdom or the United States, what was critical was to prevent the Islamic State from gaining a sanctuary from which it could export terror to our respective countries, others around the world. So the focus should have been on decomposing the Islamic State's ability to function as an effective entity first. Now, it wouldn't have solved the underlying problems, but neither has what we have done in the past either. By taking three years to do this, We also gave the Islamic State the gift of time, which strategists did not consider. But let me give you a specific example. While operations commenced in August of 2014, it was 15 months 
before any pressure was put on the Islamic State's oil distribution network. That's what brought money into their coffers. The concern by some at different levels was that the drivers who were driving the oil trucks to distribute the oil were really just trying to earn a living. Central Command were focused on avoiding any what they would call collateral damage or civilian casualties. But in fact, drivers of oil trucks in the Islamic State's oil distribution system are legitimate military targets. Because of that, we didn't attack that oil distribution system until December of 2015. Because we didn't attack them for 15 months, that allowed over $800 million to be poured into the Islamic State's coffers. And during that 15th month period, thousands, if not tens of thousands of innocent men, women, and children were killed. So an excessive focus on collateral damage avoidance only lengthens conflict, allows the adversary to continue pursuing their heinous objectives. No one in the military wants to cause collateral damage or kill civilians, but there's no such thing as immaculate warfare. That's why it's known as the last resort, the quickest way to terminate Collateral damage and avoid civilian casualties is to eliminate the cause as rapidly as possible. The mistake that we made in Operation Inherent Resolve is the strategists didn't understand that that was a possibility. Part of that responsibility lies on airmen not advocating and articulating for national security alternatives that air power provides. Jointness isn't going along to get along. Jointness is advocating what your particular service component can bring to the table to assist in a joint approach to the accomplishment of national security operations. The beauty of a joint approach is that a joint task force commander can select among his or her components, Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine, the appropriate elements to achieve the objectives. It's not using every place everywhere all the time. It's not giving out fair shares of the war to fight. Unfortunately, air power since 9-11 has tend to be viewed as simply a support function. And the result of that erred in Operation Inherent Resolve. Now, don't get me wrong. The men and women at the tactical level that executed operations in Operation Inherent Resolve did it magnificently. I'm not talking about them. I'm talking about strategy. Kosovo is another example of where you have a land-centric dominant commander who is dictating targets at a tactical level focused solely on armies. Now, don't get me wrong. We need strong armies, but we don't always need to have them in charge. The first lesson here is that if you're operating at a strategic level, if you are the supreme allied commander of Europe, you should not be involved in targeting in Kosovo. And that's what happened in the first portion of Kosovo. That didn't work because it wasn't about armies. It was about the influence that Milosevic had in the conduct of the atrocities he was committing on the ground. So you have to affect Milosevic, which then got us into that secondary portion where we started going against targets that affected him in downtown Belgrade and its surrounding areas, taking out the bridges. People had to go across those bridges to go to work. If you stop their means of going to work, now they're not getting paid. Now you induce the population to put pressure on Milosevic to cease and desist. Air power has an enormous advantage over surface forces in the conduct of counterinsurgency warfare. Drones, a remotely potted aircraft, provide precision, they provide persistence, and they provide perspective. In northern Waziristan and Pakistan, we completely changed the dynamic of al-Qaeda's operations and other terrorists, even when there were no drones present. They don't come out. They don't communicate. Because the concern is they're being watched. So 
we've gone a long way from what our forefathers in air power theorized could have accomplished, but they couldn't imagine, nor did they have the technologies that we today in the modern era do have to bring their theories to reality. As you look to the future, I dare say we won't be able to forecast what's going to happen 100 years hence. But we do have some inklings of technologies that are on the verge of actualizing. Directed energy. Directed energy is a fancy word for laser beams. We've been able to operate and employ effects at the speed of sound since 1947. Imagine the impact of being able to employ kinetic force at the speed of light. Inside the atmosphere, we got problems, attenuation of those laser beams with uh, moisture in the atmosphere. But now let's take a look at space. I dare say we'll have the opportunity to employ directed energy weapons in space before we'll be able to do so inside the atmosphere. With the challenges that are now coming up to our space-based system and the fragility of that architecture, I think you're going to see a rapid evolution to kinetic application of force into space sooner rather than later. AI, you're going to see more and more application to help people make decisions quicker. As the director of Air Force Intelligence Surveillance and Reconnaissance back in, uh, I don't know, 2008, 2009, I was trying to get across to the leadership in the Department of Defense that we had so many sensors already that we were swimming in sensors, therefore we need to avoid drowning in data. Well, guess what? We're still drowning in data. We only process about 1% to 2% of all of the information we collect on a daily take today. AI is going to help us crack that nut, which will then accelerate our ability to make accurate decisions before our adversaries do. Remotely potted aircraft, unmanned aerial vehicles, drones, whatever you'd like to call them, we're in the nascent stages of employment today. We're about where we were with manned aircraft in about the 1920s. So there's a long way to go. We'll start using them not to completely replace manned aircraft, but to supplement them. An F-35, an F-22, weapons capability, not so much. Information capability, enormous. Imagine if you match them with drones to supplement their weapons carriage as well as sensor capability. Hypersonic weapons is another one. So these are all technologies that will have some pretty dramatic implications for the near-term future, 10 to 15 years in, into the future. If I was to start an aircraft program today to come into use at some time in the future, would it have a person in it or not? My response would be, it depends on what it is that you want that aircraft to be able to do. We are not at a point in time yet today where artificial intelligence along with a series of sensors, can replace the sensors that consist of two eyeballs and a brain and a human being tied together to make decisions on a rapid basis to an infinite number of situations. Computers and processing power can only do what they've been programmed to do. So the short answer to that question is, yes, I'd have a human in it. There may be situations where I can take the human out. I'd build an optionally inhabited vehicle so that I can have a human in it or humans. And where I don't need them, they may not be in there. A subject that's of current high interest in the United States, because there's this issue of forming a space force independent of the Air Force, is how rapidly are we shifting from airborne platforms that operate inside the atmosphere to space-based vehicles operating outside the atmosphere. And will that shift actually occur? My initial response to that is no, we're not going to shift air-based platforms into space. You will see the proliferation of space-based systems that can employ weapons that ultimately will result in warfare in space. That will happen, and no treaty is going to prevent it. But as long as humans inhabit the surface of the Earth, we will continue to operate inside the atmosphere. So airplanes aren't going away. They might become faster. They might be equipped with directed energy weapons that can employ at the speed of light. But just because space is out there and we're moving into it to a greater degree than we ever have before, and that degree will accelerate, 
you're not going to see the end of the airplane. 